This makes sense. Yeah, this could be the last place that she was seen. That she was seen right here at this now rundown former gas station. I knew when she didn't call me on October 19th, because that's my birthday. And when that phone call never came and a few days passed, I knew something had happened to her. She was on this single mission to get down to Mexico by bicycle. Church mission, right? Because she wanted to help the poor. She was never supposed to be in that part of the world. It was, that wasn't part of her, her journey. Her journey was just to go into Mexico from California and then back home. In her journal, she does mention that she came across a man named Bob that was part of the same group yes. and that he informed her not to go through Mexico, instead go through the U.S. side. Right. So it would cover California, Arizona, then New Mexico. Now that I see it, this makes sense. She's riding her bike from west to east, right? Right. She get, takes that the exit, she takes that, that exit right there, stops at this gas station. Now we do know Jennifer spoke to three different people at that gas station. We're looking for the Ordonances. Jennifer asked how to get to Chihuahua. The attendant at the gas station also did an interview with police. He said he did talk to her and he saw her and she had a nice bike. He also mentioned that he saw her on the payphone for about 10, 15 minutes. From there, she was going to head up to Las Cruces, and she didn't get to Las Cruces. What did she decide from here, right. or did somebody else decide her fate for her? What's interesting, though, is it would take an entire year, and her belongings are found. Yes. Let's keep digging. Let's go. from Deming to seven miles south of Hatch and two miles in, something happened. Right. This is weird, right? So this is where our gear was found? Yeah. What do you think she said that? Ready, guys? Let's do it. Hey, everyone. I'm Crystal. I was a TV news reporter and anchor for more than 15 years, covering stories of remarkable people, tragedies that turned into heartbreak, and stories that are now part of history. But there are some stories that just stick with you. Wait, how many missing persons cases do you believe you have? Every year, tens of thousands of people are listed as missing. You see how we've come so far. So I called in the expertise of my longtime friend, retired detective, now private investigator Lewis. No, I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. It there's no evidence behind it, you know. Together, we're diving into cases that sit untouched for years. Like maybe they missed something. I feel they focused too much on him. I think so. And it may not have been him the whole time. And hitting the road. All right, you ready? Farmington, here we come. Along the way, we'll talk to those left behind. She was wonderful. She was my older sister. Something feels missing. Just want her home. Something's not right. And to those who were part of the investigation. I mean, the same dog found uh, burnt remains. All in hopes of uncovering new details. He has never been interviewed by police. That's the person that I think did it. To give families some closure as we go beyond the case. Again, again, again. Dial it in. No, I think we're good. You guys ready? And three, two. Hey everyone, welcome back to Beyond the Case. I'm Crystal. Uh, hello everybody, I'm Lewis. In this week's episode, we're trying to help a mom find her daughter who went missing when she was 18 years old. She was supposed to go on a mission. 
trip and meet up with some other people in Mexico. That's right. Jennifer Pentela went missing back in October of 1991. That was the last time anyone either saw or heard from her. She's originally from Montana, but she went on a missionary trip that sent her from Montana down to San Diego, California first. That mission trip fell through, so she just decided to ride her bike right along the southern border of the United States and ending up in Deming, New Mexico. And that's where her story comes to an end, or I should say where her disappearance begins. There's a lot of strange things uh, surrounding this case, Crystal especially when her belongings were found stored away about seven miles away from town. And what's interesting about that is that the people who found her belongings, it seemed kind of suspicious. They, it didn't look as if somebody was staying where her camping gear was. Right. They thought possibly she either set it up herself and just left, or maybe someone else set it up and left it there. We're going to backtrack Jennifer's steps. Mm -hmm. Along the way, she would stay in heavily populated areas in some churches, and uh, she would call home. She'd use a payphone to call mom. Because that's all really she had was a payphone for any form of communication at that time. She had her bicycle, her backpack, some camping gear, a couple of Bibles. That's right. And more importantly, she had her faith. The biggest obstacle that we may face, though, is that we have several different directions that she could potentially have gone in when it comes to theories, one being Mexico, the other being Texas, possibly even right here in New Mexico. And this would be the last place that she was seen. Was somebody following her? Was somebody watching her? Riding a bike by herself. By herself. By herself. In the middle of the desert. Right. Without a cell phone. Nothing. Which would make her extremely vulnerable. That's right. You know, and, and speaking of theories, we have come up with a lot of theories on this case. That's right. We're talking to people who saw her last. We're talking to family members who last spoke to her. We're getting in touch with friends who were hoping she was going to go visit them. And we're going to try to see where her story really came to an end. So pack on up because we're heading down to Southern New Mexico this time. Yeah, let's go. I've been trying to look for all of these things to hold on to, but oh, I'm finding better days with you. Hold on to me let's head to Denny. as we dive into the All right, while you're driving, Let's talk about what we know. Her first stop was going to be right outside of San Diego, California. That mission fell through. So that's when she decided, I'm going to head east. Let's see if I could head into Mexico with another missionary group. And that was going to be outside of New Mexico. So she decides to get on her bike, right? Stopping along churches, right? Mm -hmm. She didn't have a cell phone. No. We know that. She would stop and use pay phones. Yes. And that is the crucial piece of the puzzle because she was using a payphone the last time anyone heard from her, meaning family members or friends. Right. When she called me from Deming is when I told her she was she said she was headed to Las Cruces, and I told her I'd get her an air or a bus ticket, and she was going to call me when she got to Las Cruces the next day, and that phone call never came. It's, it's, it's hard not having her. It makes your, your life's not the same. Jennifer was my beautiful daughter. Tell me about Jennifer and her ambitious journey of becoming a missionary. When did it begin? Probably when she was in high school, her girlfriend, Michelle, and her, they just, you know, they got going into the churches and stuff. She just always wanted to help people. And What did she tell you? Did she tell you, I have this dream of becoming a missionary? Actually, when she was a senior in high school, she went to Africa. You know, she was helping with, you know, people who needed help out there. When she came back from there, she was went down to Mexico on a, a church mission. had a plan mapped out that she was going to go down from San Diego because she flew into San Diego and caught up with some of the friends that she'd met on that first trip to Mexico. And then she was going to go, you know, go down the border through California and down through Mexico and then just circle around and then come back up to San Diego and fly back home. When she got to San Diego, did she contact you when she first got there? Oh, yeah. 
Yep, yep, I got the uh, copies of all the phone calls that she did. You know, she let me know when she got there and would know when she was leaving and yeah, no, she she kept pretty good in contact with me. And what was her first phone call with you when she got to San Diego? What did she tell you? She was just excited that she got there and she was excited to see her friends and And then this is October 6th. Yeah, it's a little bit more here. She says, tonight is my first night camping out by myself. I'm in a very small town called Potterio, P-O-T-R-E-R-O, in Southern California. I've decided to go a different route than I had originally planned. Instead of going across the border and through the desert on the Mexican side, I'm going on the American side. Bob and I discussed it a lot, and he really thought it would be better for me. Since I've made the decision, I really feel a lot more at peace. I've decided that I would try for a week, and if I then I don't feel God pushing me on, I'm going to head back to TCAT and do some volunteer work for Christian Outreach Appeal. I want to make sure I don't re rely on other people's doubts or even my own, but God. Bob and I were up at about 7.30 this morning, and we went out and got some tortillas to have for breakfast. I think I left Tico at about 9.30. When I got across the border, I decided to go to the Sunday service with Bob. It was really nice. It didn't get going until about 11.30, and by the time it was very hot, I made my way east, but found that going very difficult. It was all uphill. I can only make it about eight miles before I came to a town and decided to call it quits. I felt a little wimpy, but I was a little too tired to really care. I'm be beginning to think I should have just taken the train through Mexico. Anyway, I found a nice campsite and settled in. I called mom. It was nice to hear a familiar voice. As soon as I reached the, the ranger station, I splurged on a 60 cent can of Pepsi. I couldn't help it. It looked too appealing to pass up. The spot's nice, except for the 60 zillion flies. I was cooking my dinner of noodle soup in banana wrapped in tortilla. Then Bob made up on his motorbike. What a surprise. He was looking for someone from the church who lives around here when he saw the tent and came over to see if it was me. It really made my evening to talk to him again. Thank you, God. Well, I'd better sleep. Then October 7th, it says, what a day. It started out a nightmare and ended up pretty good. I did not sleep well, so I did not get as early a start as I had hoped. I was finally on the road about nine o'clock and already it was hot. Not a good sign. The next town was about 12 miles away and once again, 90% uphill. It took a little longer than I had expected and I arrived in camp about 1130. I decided to rest a little and then get water and continue on. Well, it didn't quite work out that way as my day to get under my tire went flat. So I muttered my way up to the local hardware shop and found someone to help me fix my tire. Did she tell you why she biked into uh, across Arizona and then into New Mexico? Was she planning on heading into Mexico from there? No, she just decided that she was going to, she had her bike and she was just going to continue biking and that would be a, be a route to get her, you know, back up to Minnesota is why, you know, I'm presuming is why she did it. We were going to get her a bus ticket to get back home. Okay. So that was when she got to Deming, that conversation. There's in the reports, Marita, Marita Dornish, mm -hmm. right? Marita 
was a lady that that Jennifer spoke with at the gas station. Yes. The last place that she made that phone call. Yes. We need to try to find her. There's another man that was at that gas station. His father owned the gas station. Yes. His name, they called him Chewy. Right. Jesus Vasquez, yes. we should try to get a hold of him. Yes. And because according to law enforcement records, he may have been the last person that yeah. saw her. Yeah. You know, we should go and try to see what's there. See if the gas station's still there. Yeah, I agree. You ready? Yes. You nervous? No, I just, I hope we're able to get Jesus to talk to us. We are at one of the checkpoints here. Welcome to Demi, guys. Yeah. We made it. Hello, Demi. Tell us the story. We need to find the Servimat gas station. Okay. Okay, here's another gas station. This is Snappy Mart. Coming up to it. The highway's right here. There's yes. a Chevron. It's stopping here. That looks old. Looks old. And we're actually working an old missing person case. Did you guys ever hear of the Jennifer Pentela case? That sounds familiar. Was this happen to be the serving mart? No. From a long, long time ago? No. Do you know where that is? You know it's like it's it used to be a shell station, right? It's closed. Do you know which one that is? It's the one it, uh, right across from the Deming Motel. Well, thank you very much. It is down the street, actually. Oh, this was definitely an old gas station. Right. Jesus mentioned that he looked out the window and that he could see the direction in which her bike was parked in front. Sure. He also mentioned that he saw her on the payphone for about 10, 15 minutes talking. We now know that the person she was talking to was her mom. Right. And telling her that she has now changed her mind and she's heading back home. line ends up there. Right. See it? So it probably was right here in the corner. Yeah, maybe it was somewhere here. This makes sense. Yeah, this could be the last place that she was seen. That she was seen. Right here at this now run down former gas station. This would be her view of what she saw before she either headed off back on the interstate or something else happened to right. her. And this is what is very crucial to the puzzle because you need to know where she was last seen to kind of pinpoint where she could have went. Right. Again, Jesus mentioned she started heading east, which would make sense because that's where she even told her mother she was heading. So this is where she also spoke to Maria, right? Right. Jesus and Marita, right here. Let's go talk to Marita. Let's go.
So we're traveling now to Marita's house. It should be around here somewhere. It'll be interesting to, to see what she remembers about that day. If this case has been on her mind this whole time. All right. Looks like they're home. Yes, it does. It's Sunday afternoon, right? So the, the Ordonneses used to live at this address. The new homeowner said that if we go to the house with the uh, pine tree, that we could talk with her. We're looking for the Ordonneses um, to interview them in reference to this missing, missing girl back from 1991. The rest of them, they have found in some uh, assisted, living. assisted living and all okay. that. Marita had a lot of, a lot of great information back then. was very motherly and concerned about her and worried about what could have happened if she would have went to Mexico. Right. And I'm actually going to give her the credit for, um, for changing Jennifer's mind into uh, not traveling to Mexico. There's just no concrete answers as to what happened and where Jennifer actually went after that gas station. The, um, the cops, state police, went to the border and they tried to confirm whether or not she did travel across the border. And uh, they turned up dry. Nothing, nothing came out of it, right? There's a sign right there that says, you can go to Mexico that way, Palomas, right? Or you can go to Hatch that way. We now know her belongings end up in Hatch. We don't know how they got there. Did she take them? Did somebody else take them? Did something happen to her in this city? Let's keep digging. Okay, so driving by car from the gas station to the location where they found Jennifer's belongings was roughly, what did you say? 42 minutes. Okay, and that's by car. Well, this is, this is it. Something happened along the way, right? From Deming to seven miles south of Hatch and two miles in, something happened. And this is the missing piece to the puzzle. What took place on this road is the biggest part of the mystery. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that she made it to Hatch. I don't believe that. So here's the dairy, right? Here's the dairy. And then you, you're gonna drive two miles this is weird, right? So this is where her gear was found? Yeah. This is where all of her camping gear was found, along with some baby food, blankets. Um, a lot of it was neatly folded and stacked, as if somebody had set up but didn't actually sleep here. Do you think she set up? Well, we don't know. That's what's what's bizarre is that, you know, if she did, maybe she did set it up. Maybe she did head into Hatch and she was planning on coming back here. But if you're trying to make your way back to Minnesota, why would you set up camping gear and drive right into a city just to have to ride back? Ready, guys? Let's do it. 
So this is the location around the location where that couple told law enforcement they found Jennifer's belongings. This was before they realized that she was missing right. and they just thought a camper may have lost their belongings, couldn't find it again. So they called to report the items that were just kind of set up out here. The, the location, according to the couple, was about seven miles from town and the roadway was opposite to the dairy. You can see the dairies behind yeah, us. The dairies behind you us. see some of the lights on. Yes. What, what's crazy though is if Jennifer set this up, which she's been known to have set up just random camps along the way, right? So I guess to her it may not have been so odd to us. There's no light out here. It's pitch dark out here. There's nothing. We're able to see us because we have light set up. We wanted to get the feeling of what Jennifer felt if she had set it up. Right what it would feel like for her to ride a bicycle through right. here at night or just to hang out at night by herself. You can't even see the cars off of the main roadway. To me, this is a very peculiar area to just ride your bike and, you know, set up a camp so close in the town. But it's a perfect area for somebody who wants to take advantage of a young girl on a bicycle by herself. Well, unfortunately, uh, this is our last clue to Jennifer, yeah. Jennifer's location. The last place where she may have been. She was from there, she was going to head up to Las Cruces. Is that kind of alarming then, knowing that her, all of her camping gear was found on the completely different road heading north instead of towards Las Cruces? It, well, yeah, it was, because that's not the direction she was headed. And it was weird that there was like six jars of baby food and there was lots of, there were cigarette butts that were there. Jennifer didn't have baby food and she didn't have, doesn't smoke, so she wouldn't have had cigarette butts. This is from Jennifer's mom. There's a lot of information in here about the case and what the private investigators were looking into. So let's open it. So you thought his story seemed pretty suspicious? Yeah, yeah, from the beginning. Are we focusing too much on Chewy? We might be, but he was the last person to actually have some sort of uh, contact, communication with her. What's interesting, though, is that we do have another person named Bob yes. that surfaced in California and again in Arizona. That's right. Um, she was going to get on a bus and come to see me in St. Paul, Minneapolis to check out the college I was at. Did she mention anything that was odd for her? Maybe she met somebody that was just kind of yeah. odd? Yeah. She said there was, I um, can't remember if it was like a bus driver or somebody that was really odd. Did anybody ever talk to you about David Parker Ray? He's also known as the Toy Box Killer. I don't remember any of the detectives mentioning, you know, his name to me. So you've never seen any of the items that were confiscated from his home? No. I sent you a couple of pictures. Would you be able to take a glance at those pictures real fast? They've been climbing the, the wrong tree the whole time. There's no way did anything to, to her daughter, and I'm so sorry. I hope you guys catch him. 